Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Devino. I see many familiar faces out here, so thank you for coming this afternoon. Uh, this is our third day of our Ethan Allen Day observance, and I'm not sure how many of you saw this, but it was on Channel 5 uh, okay. yesterday, and it's in the, the free press also, that on Friday we had 21 new American citizens who were sworn in here in our lobby. Yeah. Senator Leahy was here, and, uh, and had some other dignitaries. It was very, very impressive to see these young folks all dressed in their Sunday best, and uh, Families, you know, extended families with them. It was a very impressive. The ceremony was at two o'clock. At five after one, they were all sitting in place. And that, that kind of, that's, how, that's how these people were. Very, very impressive. Yesterday we had uh, uh, we had a, a gunsmith, we had a wood carver, we had a spinner, and uh, uh, someone doing talks in our garden. So we had about five various. Uh, activities going on through the day and of course today is our third Sunday of the month lecture on the fourth Sunday of the month because of the, the other activities that we had going on. So it's going to be a real pleasure for me to introduce Jim Hogue. So has anybody seen Jim before? He's, uh, he's been around for quite some time. He is a stage veteran who has directed several productions. Uh, he may be seen on Dutch television as Jim Hogue the Vermont Secessions, right? Uh, he operates a small farm, trains his Arabian horse, Harold, and he hosts a radio program um, at nine o'clock on Mondays on WGDR, which you can pick up on your computer at WGDR.org, okay? Now a little bit about Ethan Allen. This is a quote from the uh, biography of Ethan Allen by Jared Sparks in 1829. Okay. 1829. So this guy could have been almost a contemporary of Ethan, right? He died in 1789. There is much to admire in the character of Ethan Allen. He has proved brave, generous, and frank. True to his friends, true to his country, consistent and unyielding in his purposes, seeking at all times to promote the best interests of mankind a lover of social harmony, and a determined foe to the artifices and injustice and the encro encroachments of power. Few have suffered more in the cause of freedom. Few have borne their suffering with a firmer co constancy or a loftier spirit. To no individual among her patriot founders is the state of Vermont more indebted for the basis of her free institutions and the achievement of her independence than to Ethan Allen. Now, wouldn't it be nice if Ethan Allen was here with us to tell us about this today, right? Oh, my goodness. I believe he has just arrived on the stage. I, I thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ethan. Some are appointed to office in these states that read the history of the cruelties of these wars with the same careless indifference as they do the pages of the Roman history. Nay. Some are appointed to places of trust and, and are influenced by the Tories. We hold such influence in disdain for it, for it denies the blood and treasure that we have spent on our liberty. Ever since I arrived at a state of manhood, and acquainted myself with the general history of mankind, I have felt a sincere passion for liberty. The history of nations doomed to perpetual slavery in consequence of yielding up to tyrants their natural born liberties, I read with a sort of philosophical horror. So that the first systematical and bloody attempt at Lexington to enslave America thoroughly electrified my mind and fully determined me to take part with my country. And as I was wishing for an opportunity to signalize myself on its behalf, directions were privately sent to me from the then colony of Connecticut to raise the Green Mountain Boys, and if possible with them, to surprise and take the fortress Ticonderoga. This enterprise I cheerfully undertook. And after guarding the several passes that led thither to cut off intelligence between the garrison and the country, made a forced march from Bennington, and arrived at the lake on the evening of May 9th, 1775 with 283 valiant 
green mountain boys. We had the utmost difficulty in procuring boats to cross the lake, but I landed 83 men at the garrison and sent the boats back to the rear guard commanded by Colonel Seth Warner. But as the day began to dawn, I found myself under the necessity to attack the fort before the rear could cross the lake. As this was deemed hazardous, I harangued the officers and soldiers in the manner following. Friends and fellow soldiers, you have for a number of years past been a scourge and terror to arbitrary power. Your valor is famed abroad and acknowledged, as appears by the advice and orders to me from the General Assembly of Connecticut, to surprise and attack, and attack the fortress before us. I propose to advance before you and in person conduct you through the wicket gate. For we must this morning either quit our pretenses to valor or, or take charge of this fortress. As this is a most dangerous attempt, a most desperate attempt, I do not urge it on any contrary to his will. You that will undertake voluntarily poise your firelock. Well, that is the introduction, the opening chapter of Colonel Ethan Allen's narrative of his captivity. Interestingly enough, the, the, the title is about this long in the original edition. Um, I mention that because that is Ethan as the soldier. I hope to cover quickly Ethan, the philosopher, Ethan, the religious philosopher, and Ethan, the negotiator for the Haldimand negotiations. And those three topics should uh, take us to about 45 minutes, and at which time I hope you will have questions. Um, there are various quotations that I think are important. So you heard Ethan the soldier. Now, listen to Ethan, the, the rational soldier, the humanitarian. When he was on parole, one of the charges he took upon himself as an officer on parole in New York during his two years, eight months captivity was to try to look after whatever prisoners he could. And the British uh, deliberately starved the prisoners. And here's an account of one particular prisoner. I was, and the prisoners were kept confined in the basement of churches or in churchyards with guards. I was in one of the churchyards and it was rumored among those in the church and sundry of the prisoners came with their usual complaints to me and among the rest a large boned tall man as he told me from Pennsylvania who was reduced to a mere skeleton. Said he was glad to see me before he died which he had expected to have done last night but was a little revived. He furthermore informed me that he and his brother had been urged to enlist in the British service, but had both resolved to die first. That his brother had died last night in consequence of that resolution and that he expected shortly to follow him. But I made the other prisoners stand a little off and told him with a low voice to list, which means to enlist. Then he asked whether it was right in the sight of God I assured him that it was, and that duty to himself obliged him to deceive the British by enlisting and deserting the first opportunity, upon which he answered with transport that he would list. I charged him not to mention my name as his advisor, uh, lest it should get air, and I should be closely confined in consequence of it. So my point there being that Ethan had a, a rational approach to, to the military. And he saw the most effective thing that these officers and soldiers could do would be when pressed to enlist and then do what damage they could after that. They're doing their country more, more good that way and they're saving their own lives and many of them had wives and children to return to, so that the, the honor that was, is generally considered the honor of the soldier 
does not, is, is second to reason. Reason is what God gave us. And we would be disobeying the will of God if we did not use our reason. And when we get to the oracle of man, which is a 500 page treatise on religion, you will see why he got in so much trouble. Because he was pointing out that if God hadn't wanted us to think, he wouldn't have given us a brain. <laughs> and that is the opposite of what church and state teach. And so he did not make many friends with those kinds of, of attitudes. And uh, I could quote you some of the uh, horrible things that were said about him. And I happen to believe that a lot of it had to do with his ability to spot hypocrisy and to think clearly about militarism and what the state and the church were asking people to do. Um, I have a quote from this wonderful little book, which is probably on sale here, called The Quotable Ethan Allen. And this quote describes his attitude toward hypocrisy very clearly. The, there was a group of Vermonters that, well, not just Vermont, they weren't Vermonters at the time, a, a group of settlers who moved to a place in Pennsylvania called Wyoming, and they wanted to set up their own <coughs> place on earth, which Ethan called the right to self-preservation, and Blackstone, the, the law dictionary, calls it uh, the um, safety of the whole. But Ethan called it the right to self-preservation. And here is what he has to say about the hypocrisy of, of the government of Pennsylvania. In these scenes of horror and complicated woe, we were your frontier. Our blood answered for yours. Our hazard and unparalleled distress purchased your safety. We stood between you and the tomahawk and scalping knife and diverted the inhuman strokes from you. But alas, what returns have we had from your government? The widows and orphans of those who fell in the common cause of America, particularly in your defense, have been plundered, despoiled of their goods, and driven from their habitations and legal possessions, which other inhabitants in general and the whole treated nearly as inhumanly as by the common enemy and many of our inhabitants have been killed by the hostile attempts of government to dispossess us of our lands and labors without the formality of a trial by law. Your government hitherto have been extremely earnest to cram their laws down our throats and do not fail to hold up to our view the sanctity thereof. The law, they say, is holy, just, and good, but the said inhabitants, alias Yankees, are carnal, riotous, rebellious, and sold under sin, and our lands and labors must pay for it. In fine, the inhabitants of Wyoming and its vicinity are so sinful and rebellious that you gentlemen of the militia of Pennsylvania must leave your farms and occupations, wives and children, and at the hazard of your lives, kill and destroy those ugly Yankees who guarded your frontier in the late war, and who, if you do not extirpate, will guard you in a subsequent one, that the people of the state at large have a right to judge, and even interpose in this interesting dispute will further appear when by a government swayed by interest, interested and overbearing men, they are ordered to march under arms to the hostile ground of Wyoming and at the hazard of their lives fight against us for no other cause, not reason, but that we will not tamely surrender our farms, orchard, tenements, labors, and right of soil to a junto of land thieves. And he goes on, naturally, he tends to. <laughs> and um, I selected this piece because I wanted in the beginning to give you a, a taste of his passion for liberty, number one, and his hatred of hypocrisy, 
number two. And of course, you can't hate hypocrisy if you don't see it. <laughs> and he saw it clearly in what was happening in Pennsylvania, and he saw it clearly in what was happening all around him. And in Pennsylvania, they were denying these settlers the right to exist when the Revolutionary War had just won. They just won through a war of secession, se seceding from England. They had, they had won that, and now, oh, well, that's, that's over. We, we, we don't have to grant you the right to exist here in Pennsylvania. And so, again, looking at who Ethan was, he attacked hypocrisy wherever he saw it. And if you can spot any in him, um, please let me know. Because I've, I've been studying Ethan Allen a long time, and I see paradoxes, sure, plenty of paradoxes. But I don't see hypocrisy in him. Um, all right, so that's a taste of the narrative and a taste of uh, his idea of hypocrisy. I wanted to tell you, give you a little bit more out of the narrative on his ideas of internationalism and peace and how to get along with your neighbors. And I find that particularly interesting right now today uh, for reasons you may gather when I, when I read this or reasons you might want to ask me about when we have time at the end. I know my friend Danny back there will know immediately what I'm talking about. Okay, um, he's talking to the British now in his book. Your power has been continued longer than the exercise of your humanity and is by no means sufficient to support your vanity. I have something of a smattering of philosophy and understand human nature in all its stages tolerably well. I am thoroughly acquainted with your national crimes and assure you that they not only cry aloud for heaven's vengeance, but excite mankind to rise up against you. Virtue, wisdom, and policy are in a national sense always connected to power. Or in other words, power is their offspring, and such power as is not directed by virtue, wisdom, and policy never fails to destroy itself as yours has done. It is so in the nature of things, and unfit it should be otherwise. For if it was not so, vanity, injustice, and oppression might reign triumphant forever. He goes on to talk about his his uh, belief that trade and cultural exchanges are what will bring peace to the world. My affections are Frenchified. I glory in Louis XVI, the generous and powerful ally of these states, and am fond of a connection with so enterprising, learned, polite, courteous, and commercial a nation. And I'm sure that I express the sentiments and feelings of all the friends of the present revolution. I begin to learn the French tongue and recommend it to my countrymen before Hebrew, Greek, or Latin, provided only one of them be attended to. For the trade and commerce of these states in future must inevitably shift its channel from England to France, Spain, and Portugal. And therefore, the statesman, politician, and merchant need be acquainted with their several languages, particularly the French. Nothing as the present revolution uh, nothing could have served so effectively and effectually to illuminate, illuminate, polish, and enrich these states as the present revolution, as well as preserve their liberty. Mankind are naturally too national, even to the degree of bigotry, and commercial intercourse with nations has a great and necessary tendency to improve mankind and erase the superstition of the mind by acquainting them that human nature, policy, and interest are the same in all nations. And at the same time, they are bartering commodities for the convenience and happiness of each nation. They may reciprocally exchange which part and customs and manners as may be, as may be beneficial and learn to extend charity and goodwill to the whole of mankind. So you can see Ethan as the defender of his place on earth, of his territory,
But you can see him also as the, a man open to commerce and cultural intercourse of all kinds and education. We we're talking about the Age of Enlightenment here, which did not go unnoticed by Ethan Allen. His belief in science was as strong as any of his beliefs in whether it be a military operation or whether it be political, he, he believed that science was the way to trump superstition and idolatry. And so let's move on to that, where Ethan says, a competency of knowledge in the sciences is our only bulwark against superstition and idolatry. The superstitious parts of mankind, which one means or other, are far the more numerous, are but the dupes of church and state, at whose command they cut one another's throats as they suppose for God's, as they suppose uh, for God's sake, and commit all manner of cruelty and outrage. How many ideas can you put in two sentences? Um, I hope we can talk about that if we, if we have time later, because that is a mouthful. The whole idea of seeing what church and state gets people to do, how it gets them to behave in opposition to logic, reason, and science, he got. And he wrote his oracle, the, the, um, the reason, reason, the only oracle of man, to make this point. Now, um, I'll go a little bit into the oracle and then um, spend time talking about one of his greatest accomplishments, which was the Haldeman negotiations. How many of you know what, I, what they were? Oh, good. OK, oh, one, two, OK. So you can, you can verify what I'm saying or criticize it, however you wish. Um, OK, the Oracle of Man. This, these are Ethan's own words in a, in a book called The American Deists, of which he was one. Benjamin Franklin was another, for example. By the way, somebody in, in Ethan's opening remarks, he says, thoroughly electrified my mind. Somebody in an audience once said, well, they didn't have electricity in those days. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to say, oh, who was Benjamin Franklin? <laughs> what, what, what is the one thing you learn about Benjamin Franklin if you don't know anything else? So anything, anyway. Um, this, is a, this is, again, a mouthful. So um, let's, see what, uh, let's see how we do with it. This is from his book, Reason the Only Oracle of Man. So you're getting an idea that uh, he was fairly articulate, if maybe a bit too wordy. Um, the desire of knowledge has engaged the attention of the wise and curious among mankind for ages, which has been productive of extending the arts and sciences far and wide in the several quarters of the globe and excited the contemplative to explore nature's laws in gradual series of improvement till philosophy, astronomy, geography, and history and many other branches of science have arrived to a great degree of perfection. It is nevertheless to be regretted that the bulk of mankind, even in those nations, which are most celebrated for learning and wisdom, are still carried down the torrent of superstition and entertain very unworthy apprehensions of the being, perfections, creation, and providence of God, and their duty to him, which lays an indispensable obligation on the philosophic friends of human nature unanimously to exert themselves in every lawful, wise, and prudent method to endeavor to reclaim mankind from their ignorance and delusion by enlightening their minds in those great and sublime truths concerning God and his providence and their obligations to moral rectitude, 
which in this world and that which is to come cannot fail greatly to affect their happiness and well-being. And this leads me to sort of give you a cue what's coming up. This reflects Plato in that moral good is a good activity. If you do good, mm -hmm. if you do moral activities, you will become happy. That's, that's pure Plato. And Ethan gets to that idea in one of the things that I'll be, be reading you. And that is, happiness is uh, being a moral good. And he says, moral good is the only source from whence a rational mind can be supplied with a happiness agreeable to the dignity of its nature. It would be impossible for omnipotence itself to make a vicious mind taste the ecstatic felicity of a moral happiness, so long as it may be supposed to be vicious inasmuch as, as morality in the nature of the thing itself is a prerequisite to that happiness. Without the possession and actual enjoyment of which the mind cannot be mentally happy or enjoy itself agreeable to its discerning, conscious, and sentimental nature, but must disapprove of the erroneous departure or its vicious pursuits from the amiable rules of moral fitness and feel proportionably guilty and miserable. That was one sentence. <laughs> <sighs> and um, it, it, so I, I don't, I never recommend anybody try to read Reason the Only Oracle of Man. I couldn't get through it myself. But um, I am extremely impressed at his ability to reason in the same way that the great philosophers uh, reason. I, I assume that he read Plato. I mean, if he read, he, he studied under uh, John Young and studied the classics, <clears throat> he studied Greek, and whether or not he, he learned any of the Greek language is neither here nor there. Uh, the fact is that he studied all the great philosophers and out of which he came into a new enlightenment himself, which was that the church and the state are feeding you a lot of superstition so that you will behave the way they want you to, so that you'll pay your taxes, so that you'll fight their wars for them that may not do you any good at all, may not do humanity any good at all. But they have their reasons, and they will persuade you to do it. I remember the, this is in direct opposition to what um, the, the war poets from 1911 uh, through 1917 said that you know, they got home and the minister would say to them, well, you did your part. You fought God's cause. You know, you might only have one leg, but it's worth it. <laughs> and, and Ethan knew long before that what nonsense that was and how that your own reason should play a part in a democracy and, and just to, to, make you more of, to make you a full human being. That is what ought to play a part in your lives. And I'm, I came here today because people think of Ethan Allen as this brash semi-soldier, part-time soldier who took Fort Ticonderoga from 23 uh, you know, tired, sleeping English. And, and by the way, I want to mention that generally I would think that a soldier who does his homework and, and realizes that the fort is poorly defended would usually be complimented. For that. I mean, isn't that the idea that you, you do your research and you scout the place and you find out what you're going to be up against? So what do we read today in some, by some authors? Oh, there were only 48 people there and 23 of them could fight. Well, that's the point. 
that you you try to beat the enemy. You don't try to you don't try to get all your men shot. You try to get what you want to get. And and his job from Connecticut it wasn't actually the General Assembly, but I don't think he knew that. Um, and Benedict Arnold was, of course, with him on this assault. And the idea was to take it without getting anybody killed and without killing anybody. And that's exactly what he did. And he sent, as you probably know, he sent the cannon to Washington at Dorchester Heights. And that is arguably what scared uh, General Gage out of Boston and sent him fleeing to New York. So I consider that an accomplishment. I don't consider that something to make fun of. <laughs> um, whereas people, for some reason, like to like to go after Ethan Allen for things for his great accomplishments. And that leads me to the Haldeman negotiations, which I consider his greatest accomplishment for the um, for the creation of a safe Vermont outside of the the ten years he kept New York at bay with the Green Mountain Boys. Um, and again, if you have any questions about the Green Mountain Boys and how all that happened, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, so, the Haldeman negotiations, what was that all about? Um, I will read you a little bit about how they started and, and why they started. Uh, essentially, the official story from Ethan is the Haldeman negotiations with General Haldeman in, in uh, Montreal were to free prisoners, were to make an exchange of prisoners. But they accomplished so many more things than that, that I think it's really worth talking about Ethan as the negotiator, as the representative of Vermont who made this happen. He wasn't the only one. Ira was a very big player, Ira Allen, in this. And so was uh, Governor um, Chittenden at the time. So here we have the Holderman negotiations. Um, and we have a, a letter from George Washington and another letter uh, from Christopher, um, Christopher, why can't I think of his name? Carlton, which is um, General Carlton there. So Washington says, I have been favored to, um, to the headquarters of Ethan Allen. I have been favored with yours of the 16th instant. I cannot, without deviating from the rule of conduct, which I have constantly observed, exchange the officers of Colonel Warner's regiment at this time, because there are a great many who have been much longer in captivity and have therefore a just right to a preference, but to endeavor to afford them the best relief the nature of the cause case will admit, I have written to General Haldeman and proposed to him to send them and the other prisoners of war in his possession to New York, et cetera, et cetera. That's George Washington to Ethan Allen. Now, that's how these negotiations got started, because Ethan thought that it was um, not exactly kosher to treat the prisoners the way they were being treated. And then we have a, a letter from Christopher Carlton uh, back to um, Ethan Allen. By the bearer, Captain Sherwood. Sherwood was a Green Mountain boy who became a Tory because he felt that the, the United States, well, it wasn't the United States, he, he felt that America should remain part of uh, the British Empire. Um, blah, 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 blah. I received General Haldeman's letter to Governor Chittenden on subject of an exchange of prisoners. I have authorized Captain Sherwood to treat with the governor and you on the subject. Though, I, though could I meet with you or him or both perhaps, the business would be sooner concluded as should any difficulty arise between Captain Sherwood and you, my instructions are so ample that I flatter myself I could remove them, etc. I mentioned these two letters because I wanted to give you a little history as to how these negotiations first began, and again, ostensibly to free prisoners. But I'll tell you in the course of this little talk 
how many more other things were achieved in the course of these negotiations. Um, Ethan was accused by some, and even today there are a few people who haven't got it, haven't figured it out. He was accused of some of, of treason, because here's this guy from, you know, who knows where, Vermont, what's that, who's negotiating with the chief governor of Canada for the exchange of prisoners. And he has no right to do that. What's the big deal? What, 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 who does he think he is? And, and yet, he was successful. What did he accomplish by entering into these negotiations with General Haldeman? Well, he accomplished a secession of hostilities between the British Empire and Vermont. He said, here's, here's the carrot. If we pull this off, I would like to bring Vermont back into the British Empire. That was the carrot. Now, even um, this wonderful fellow who was here, gave a talk here, um, David Bennett, who writes this book with the idea that Ethan was serious about joining, he quotes Ethan as saying, no way I could pull this off. The people of Vermont would have my head. So I think that's good enough evidence that it was, a, it was just a carrot so that these exchanges could go forth. But much more than that, it was a carrot to keep the British from using Lake Champlain and Vermont as a corridor and raiding Vermont towns, uh, fighting the Vermont militia or the Continental Army as it was at that time in Vermont. So those kinds of accomplishments are not to be shrugged off as, as minor. And another great accomplishment was that if he could postpone this long enough, at least through the fall of 81, I think we're, we're into now, he could allow the farmers to harvest their crops, which was pretty important in those days. If you didn't harvest your crop, you starved. So some people look at this and say, Ethan was brilliant. Some people look at this and say, oh, he was just lucky. He was really trying to join the British Empire and all this other stuff. Well, you know, that just kind of happens. Well, usually in history, when a leader accomplishes something, you tend to ascribe intent to that accomplishment. So in, in the case of Ethan, if he prolonged the British, any potential British invasion, then that's what he tried to, then that was his intent. If he did that so that farmers could harvest their hay and their crops, that was his intent. If he did that so that uh, the British couldn't use, wouldn't use Lake Champlain and, and raid the, the towns, that was what he intended to do. And if he also achieved what he said he wanted to do, which was exchange prisoners, then wow, good for you, Ethan. You've done all these things. That's, that's amazing. And we still have people who question these negotiations. And again, I don't mean to say that Ethan was like the only leader behind this because Ira was important and, and uh, Governor Chittenden was important. And in that, um, in, among those accomplishments, uh, um, Haldeman and Burgoyne both considered the Vermonters, and that is to say the Green Mountain Boys at the time, a formidable enemy. Said Haldeman, having been from their earliest contests continually in arms, they are in every respect better pr provided than continental troops and their principles more determined. And said the usually bellicose Burgoyne, who was the, the person who got his rear end kicked at, at Bennington, the, uh, the Hampshire Grants now abounds in the most active and rebellious race in the continent and hangs like a gathering storm on my left. Uh, George Washington, 
was equally respectful and wished that Congress would act to get Vermont officially on their side before it was too late. <laughs> you don't want the Green Mountain Boys fighting against you. You want them on your side. And um, I think that, again, is a tribute to Ethan Allen because he was one of the people who formed the Green Mountain Boys. And I don't want to imply that he was the only one. Um, this wonderful book, Moses Robinson and the Founding of Vermont uh, by Judge Mello, is a wonderful perspective on other people who were doing the same things that Ethan was and who they were, who went to Ticonderoga and who the Green Mountain Boys were and who did what. Um, so again, I don't, I'm not trying to overblow Ethan's importance. I'm just trying to give him credit for the amazing accomplishment of the Haldeman negotiations. So I rushed through, uh, let me see, is there anything else I wanted to mention about, oh yeah, some of you who've been, who happen to be Vermont historians might say, well, what about the Royalton Raid? The Royalton Raid was not an official raid by the British Army. And after it happened, it was regarded as a mistake. So it had nothing to do with what Ethan was trying to accomplish because they weren't supposed to do that raid. They were provoked by uh, the Kanawaga Indians who wanted some fun and wanted to you know, get some scalps and, and steal. When they came down, what did they steal? Mirrors, furniture, hats, clothing, and people, and, and, and took them back. They purposely avoided the town that they thought maybe would fight back, which was um, New, not Newport, um, the other one, anyway. Um, and they went to Royalton because it was utterly defenseless and populated by innocent settlers. So that raid, my, my point is that Ethan's Haldeman negotiations were a complete success because there were something like 54 raids in New York, Ohio, um, along the Lake Champlain, in the, Lake Champlain, in the um, Great Lakes areas. 54 raids during that period of the Haldeman negotiations and not one in the state of Vermont except for the, the Royalton Raid which had nothing to do with the British Army at all. So again, Kudos for, uh, for Ethan Allen for figuring this out. And I believed it was something that he figured out. It didn't just, <laughs> it didn't just happen. So, um, oh, there's another thing in the Oracle. What time is it? I don't wanna. 2.42. 2.42, okay. Well, I'll mention that quickly to get us up to, to 2.45. Um, there's the, Doctrine of imputation, which Ethan railed against, which is the doctrine that the sins of the father are visited upon the son. Adam and Eve, you know, they made a mistake and, and humans are, you know, going to be punished ever since. He thought that was just idiotic, just ridiculous. And um, he said, if you regard God as, as somebody who is omnipotent and who knows what he's doing, why do you say that he does these idiotic things? Why, do, why does he punish per, a person hell and eternity for telling a lie and the same punishment for murdering, you know, 20 people, whatever it is. So Ethan, Ethan went after point by point in the Bible as to why he says that religion that teaches these things is teaching superstition. And the, the doctrine of imputation is one of, the, oh, one of the points that he makes. He says, I fancy, sir, you will be diverted when you read the 12th chapter. That's of reason, the only oracle of man. It rips up and overturns the whole notion of jockeying, alienating, transferring, and imputing of sin or righteousness from one person to another and leaves all mankind accountable for their own moral agency. This is fatal to the ministerial damnation salvation. 
and their merchandise thereof. It's one of my favorite expressions of Ethan Allen, ministerial damnation salvation. So we, we damn you for this, but if you pay us, you're saved. <laughs> and he just threw up his hands and he says, how can you people believe this stuff? And that's why he was hated for writing Reason the Only Oracle of Man, because he pointed out these, what I think are rather obvious flaws in the, in the concept of a God who knows what he's doing. And he said, you know, we all believe that God knew what he was doing. And this is before Darwin, remember? There was, so there's no, nobody had thought of the concept of chaos working itself out. Um, you know, that the earth formed itself from little atoms here and nuclei here and, and the whole world grew out of that. That, that. that concept of chaos had not entered into anybody's mind yet. So Ethan believed in a God who knew what he was doing, gave man a brain, and said, well, if man's reason isn't more important than Catholicism or Protestantism or, or whatever else, how come man can go from one religion to another if he wants to? How come man can choose his religion if his brain isn't more important than your church? And of course, that got him hated because when you can't answer, <laughs> you can't answer a guy like that, you can, you can go, oh, well, that's a good point, or you can make a big fuss about it. And um, so I, again, I wanted to point out his ability to see clearly, to come up with the, the expression, the damnation salvation society is, um, I thought, a very clever way of seeing the way church and state get people to behave themselves. So um, I think I better stop yelling at you and um, pontificating because I, I think I've given you a good, pretty good idea of what I wanted to convey about Ethan Allen, from the soldier to the humanitarian to the internationalist to the scholar, mm -hmm. if you will. And so I'm hoping that you might be able to come up with some questions. Yes? About the Haldeman uh, mm -hmm. discussions, um, about how many months did it take with the um, length of time it took to get messages back and forth um, to Montreal and to where, in, where mm -hmm. he was where Ira and he were, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Chittenden. And um, was he actually just um, being insincere when he was using Vermont as a carrot? Or did he think that they'd fall for that? And then if, if the things came together, mm -hmm. how come the Brits didn't insist that Okay. He hand over Vermont. Well, you have asked the question that scholars have been wondering about ever since. And I'll and I think I can answer it. The first part, how long did it take? Well, it depended on on the given letter and where it was going. But for proof of how long it took, some of these prisoners didn't get released till after the war was over. And these negotiations started long before that. So it, it did take a long time for communications to, to make it from one place to another. And some uh, escaped from, they were, they were imprisoned, many of them, on an island on the St. Lawrence where the currents were wicked. I mean, if you tried to swim, you'd just get sucked under. And some people who were great swimmers apparently made it or they grabbed a hold of a log and, you know, went along, but it was a very difficult um, trek. Even if you got across into Vermont, it, you had a very difficult time getting home. And so many died in, in that process <coughs> who had already been ex supposedly exchanged. Yeah. Um, so it, it was a, it's a pretty ironic and tragic uh, situation that it took so long to get these letters 
back and forth in some cases. Um, and then the other, your other question was? Um, what, what about the carrot of the oh, okay. being uh, turned over to the Brits? Oh, yes. Uh, Haldeman was very suspicious of Ethan. Mm. They knew he was a pretty clever character. And they didn't know how much influence he had in Vermont. And he himself admitted that he could never pull this off. But he didn't admit that to, yeah. to Haldeman. You know, Haldeman didn't know that. Uh, they thought, you know, here's the guy who took Ticonderoga, a prisoner, a great hero. Um, let's pay attention to him. And he bluffed his way. He bluffed New York out of, out of Vermont for 10 years, never killed anybody. He bluffed Haldeman into thinking that he was influential enough to pull this off. And so my, to me, the obvious conclusion is that it was a bluff and it worked. Good for you, Ethan. You know? So the scholars who fight over this, um, they don't know what was in Ethan's head, but they do know what he accomplished. And please just give him credit for what he accomplished. Don't assume he was trying to accomplish something else. <laughs> like, you'd, you know, with everybody else in history, if he crosses the Alps with his elephants and whatever else he does, he did that on purpose. <laughs> and whereas some scholars seem to think that what Ethan accomplished, he didn't quite accomplish on purpose. But so my answer is, it was a bluff, and Haldeman suspected it, but he couldn't resist. I mean, the idea of Vermont. Remember, Haldeman was scared of the Green Mountain Boys. They were tough. And they knew how to fight, and they knew how to fight guerrilla warfare. So Haldeman didn't want to go up against the Green Mountain Boys any more than New York did. They, they never did. They were just scared, now you won't use the word, of the Green Mountain Boys. <laughs> and that was because Ethan knew how to bluff. The Green Mountain Boys weren't that great that they could beat a force 10 times greater, um, but he made people think that they were. Yes. Can you give some more details about uh, how the Haldeman, the negotiations with the Haldeman worked and what was accomplished? Was, I mean, there was an exchange of prisoners. Was that just the prisoners that were held uh, in, on the island in the St. Lawrence for prisoners, British prisoners who were held where? And what I, was accomplished? I don't, I know that some prisoners were held as serv domestic servants in, in Montreal. But I don't know who was exchanged for whom. I, I, I might have read that at some point, but I don't remember who specifically was exchanged for whom. But I'm sure it wasn't just the ones that were on that island. Yeah. Uh, he writes about that in um, We Go as Captives. He talks about that. Um, but know, surely there were do you others. Do know the name of the island in the St. Lawrence? I could look it up before we no, it's okay. leave. Um, but uh, it's it's. Yeah, there aren't that many, so it'd be easy to, yeah. to look it up. Um, did I answer your? Uh, well, uh, were the Green Mountain Boys holding British prisoners? Yes. Or exchange for the Americans? Yes. I mean, you said they also accomplished a lot of other things. What were the other things that? Okay, were let me. Um, they 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 accomplished. In case I forgot something, with what I said before, um, keeping the doors open for statehood. I forgot that. In Philadelphia. They, they were considering, gosh, you know, Vermont might um, tell us goodbye just the way we said goodbye to England. Um, so we better, like, hang in there with them. So he kept the negotiations open for statehood, which kept Alexander Hamilton in the game. And the New Yorkers were having hissy fits because they didn't want Vermont to become a state. And the Southern Southerners were having hissy fits because they were afraid of another northern state coming in. So Ethan, by doing that, sped up the negotiations, at least temporarily, for Vermont becoming a state. So that was one. Uh, making statehood a necessary option for Congress to keep Vermont from switching sides. We said that. Buying time for the Green Mountains in the fall of 1781 to harvest their crops and prepare for battle. I wrote this, by the way, in, as part of a review of, of that book. 
um, arranging an exchange of Vermont and British prisoners. Those prisoners that Vermont held would have been officially under the Continental Army. They were, the Green Mountain Boys were put under the command of Seth Warner, and so the prisoners that they captured would have been Continental Army prisoners. But, but the negotiations were, went on nonetheless with Ethan and, uh, and Ira. And they informed Congress that, that they were doing this. Um, and negotiating a secession of hostilities. So those are the five accomplishments of, uh, of the Haldeman negotiations. While all the time, they, I've read the, the letters of Haldeman. Gee, I don't know about this guy even now. <laughs> so I, w when somebody suspects you and you still pull it off, I think that's even worth more credit to you. Yes? Um, thank you. I had no idea how amazing Ethan Allen was. In your estimation, who's a, a modern day comparable? To Ethan Allen? <laughs> Wow, what a, I, I love that. I love that question. I, I haven't had anybody, um, I haven't had anybody ask it. Um, you know, Ben Scotch calls me Ethan Allen all the time, and he says, we need you, because I'm such a thorn in the side of, of the state house and certain, certain things that don't happen that I think ought to, like public banking. Um, boy, who's a current day Ethan Allen? <laughs> The ones that haven't been killed yet. Um, well, I'll have to. How about John Kerry? Bernie? Pardon? Well. How about John Kerry? John Kerry? No, no. no. See, these these people are married to the military-industrial complex, and even Bernie, who was pimping for the F-35, you know, trying to bring the F-35. So I. I, I mean, Dennis Kucinich was sort of out there like that, and um, um, what's it, Ryan? Ryan uh, Ryan. Pa, Ryan, Ryan, Ron, Ron Paul, not Rand Paul, but Ron Paul was kind of in there, but Martin Luther King was kind of out there, which is why he got killed. And um, I, prob I could probably think of some, some people who uh, were great leaders like that. I mean, I admired Dave Dellinger. Um, he spent several years in jail for his beliefs of nonviolence. Um, so I don't know. I don't want to take up everybody's time when I don't have an answer. But uh, anyway, I love the question. I'll have to think about that. Um, yes. What is moral rectitude? I don't know what that term means. Which? Moral rectitude. Being right. That's all. Oh, okay. Being being on the right, the moral side of things, okay. doing the right thing. And supposedly, according to Plato, I there's there's a paradox here, and I don't assumed to have an answer, but the idea is that if you do the right thing, you'll feel good about it. But, you know, there are people like Henry Kissinger who just love slaughtering people. <laughs> so it doesn't hold up necessarily. Um, and I just use Henry as the first name that popped into my head. I mean, I could, I could give you a long list of people who seem to just love to make life miserable for other people, and, and they get a big kick out of it. So I can't personally agree with Ethan and Plato on the idea that um, you'll feel good if you do the right thing. You'll feel good if you do the right thing according to your own needs and, and beliefs. But that doesn't necessarily play into humanity as helping, as helping humanity. So, but that's what moral rectitude is. Any other questions? Yes. Um, the, the state of Vermont uh, became, well, Vermont became a state, what was it, 1791? Yep. Was Ethan Allen alive at that no. time? No. He wasn't. He died in 89. 
Okay. Was he in favor of Vermont becoming a state? Yes, he was very much in favor of Vermont being, becoming a state, but keep in mind what a state was then. A state was a sovereign entity then. He wouldn't have been in, you know, he, he would be turning in his grave over the, the loss of sovereignty to the states now, I think. So um, the, the uh, Vermont came in with a ratification in 200 years, so I guess it was 19, uh, 1991, there was a ratification. Of Vermont, have you heard about this? No. Um, yeah, there was, apparently uh, I had heard that that it needed to be ratified uh, in this in the state house, and and that it w I believe it was in the state house, mm -hmm. and that it was ratified, that it, it it actually came through. And I was wondering if you haven't heard about this, then of course, uh, you know, I, I was I was wondering if you could uh, share any anything about that and whether or not the the ratification. Um, uh, w w would Vermont uh, be uh, considered now a happy member of, of the Union, or, or would Ethan Allen, I, it's a speculation, would he, would, would he prefer to secede from the Union considering where it is right now? Where it is now, I'm sure Ethan Allen would want to secede. Where it was then, given that each state was a sovereign entity, yeah, you had everything to gain and nothing to lose by becoming a state because you gained the intercourse with the states, you gained power to trade, you, you gained so much by becoming a, a, a state and cultural intercourse too. It was everything, he was in favor of all of that. And uh, he even, I mean, he fought for statehood. He was very disappointed when Washington kind of said, well, hang on a minute, you know, now that, now that we've won the war, <laughs> we might just let New York take you over. <laughs> and um, but it, it didn't happen because Alexander Hamilton got involved and, and again they were afraid of the Green Mountain Boys kicking up a fuss so they became a state for various complicated reasons but they they did and they had to pay 30,000 bucks to New York to give the land jobbers in New York that, that's a I don't know how to explain it quickly but um, they, they didn't get a great deal when they um, when they joined the Union, but they, they did get to join, and that was what was most important at that time. Because, you know, there were enemies afoot. Not like today, where all the enemies are make-believe. <laughs> they, they were really worried about um, the Brits maybe, you know, trying again, which they did in 1812. So they had every reason to become a state. Yes. Did Ethan express any opinion on the new U.S. Constitution before he died? Because that would have been passed just a year or two before he died, right? Well, I don't know if it would have the '89. Same, same year that he died. Yeah, it was the same year that he died, but he died in February. Okay. So, um, and then and the news was not all that yeah. fast, and he had retired. Yeah. He was like a, a lot of the founding fathers. They said, "Look, what I want to do is." I want to have a farm, and I want to study agriculture, and I want to read. And you know, look at Jefferson's library, my God, humongous. Um, that's what these guys wanted to do. And so I, I think that Ethan, after he wrote his religious treatise, he just wanted to, he was happy, he loved it, he adored his wife and his family, and he just wanted to kind of chill out. <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't think he would have known about this the second constitution in 89, the one we have now. Yes? Um, this is a really dumb question, but the uh, um, ferocity of the Green Mountain Boys, was that a bluff or was that well-deserved? Oh, no. Because, they, you said everybody was kind of afraid of get riding us up. Is that born on fact, on history? The fear that everybody had of the Green Mountain Boys was real because the Green Mountain Boys had kicked a lot of butt over the years against superior forces in some cases, um, and they, they were extremely successful. And at the Battle of Bennington, um, they were part of the rear guard that held up the Brits at Hubberton, and Seth Warner brought them down to Bennington, and then they took a deep breath and fought again. I mean, they must have been dead exhausted. And, and the, the Battle of Bennington was a slaughter. The, they beat the, the Germans, 
and the Brits that were there. Um, it was a tremendous victory and it set up Saratoga, in my opinion. Saratoga couldn't have happened without the defeat that the British suffered in, in Bennington. I mean, I'm not alone in that opinion. I mean, I think that's a pretty well accepted opinion. It's just that in the history books, it's like, uh, well, uh, you know, they, just, they don't have time to go into all the, all the details, but that's my opinion, and I think it's generally accepted that Bennington set up Saratoga. Alrighty, well, yeah, Jim, thank you. Been wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> oh yeah, and the whole the whole narrative um, is on a double CD. It's a dramatic reading of this book. It's two CDs. It takes like from here to Albany in your car <laughs> if you want to hear it, and. Um, so it has all the adventures that Ethan had from the time he took Ticonderoga till the time he was released, uh, two years, eight months, uh, as a prisoner of war. And a friend of mine said he listened to it three times, and he always cried at that part where I read you about the, the guy who he said, go ahead and enlist, oh, and then yeah. desert later. So anyway. Yes, so Jim has those for sale afterwards, so you, and I'm sure he'll answer more questions afterwards. And we want to thank you um, for coming. You thank you. <laughs> one of our homestead mugs. Thank you. And for those of you who don't know, my name is Phyllis Drury. I am the president of the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. And so I you know, welcome you here. Thank you for coming and listening to Jim and they're sharing in our programs here. And I'm going to, um, again, say thank you. And I'm going to introduce you to you. Sure I am. I'm going to introduce you to John Davenow, who has some interest. He's, he's our organizer for all these events. And so he's well, going to give you well, some thank you, so here, Just to let you know, the third Sunday of the month is when we're going to get back on schedule next month, July 16th. And the speaker, or the person who's going to be leading the discussion is Dan O'Neill, who is our director, who was here for six years, and is now back uh, as our director as of about two months ago. Yeah. And the title of this talk is going to be The Ethan Allen Homestead Beyond Ethan. So he's going to talk about what happened to the house, who lived in that house after Ethan died, and bring it right up to modern times. Now, coincidentally, this afternoon, we had a lady and her mother who came and, uh, well, they're both ladies, I guess, but the, uh, but the younger one was born in that the house in the addition that's right over here in 1988, okay? And the house was reconstructed in like 86, 87, right? So she remembers all of the uh, things that were happening here when the house went from a farmhouse back into the state that it's there. So she's gonna be in touch with, I gave her, I uh, took her information and Dan's gonna be in touch with her uh, for this talk in July. I just got through a little tour with some people and one of the gentlemen is from South Burlington. He was on the Winooski Valley Park District Board when the homestead was created. And he has a lot of stories. He used to know Ralph Nading Hill, the person who we consider the godfather of the homestead. Uh, he remembers, uh, he had lots of stories of, of, of Ralph when, he, uh, when they were putting this together back in the 80s. So. Both of these people, I think, are going to uh, be invited to play a part in next week's, in next month's talk. So July 16th, 2 o'clock, come back, okay? All right. And, oh, well, one last word. This is an early plug. Will Randall, Will, Will Stern Randall, who many of you know, who spoke here many times, uh, he is now on a book tour with his new book that was advertised, and there was, there was an article in the paper just recently about it. I forgot what the title is. It's about the War of 1812. I don't remember the exact title. But he will be speaking in August about the War of 1812 on that third Sunday of the month. Okay, so come again.